Here's a little quiz. Can you identify these three gentlemen? If your idea of a fun party is identifying recent lesser known government officials, then this is a fun party, right? You got it? Know who these guys are? Yes, they are all former U.S. Treasury secretaries. Uh, one Treasury secretary from the George W. Bush years and the other two are from the Obama years. If you got that, congratulations, you're going to kill it at your next pub quiz trivia night, right? Uh, of course, one of the things that Treasury secretaries do is they have to travel around the world to discuss financial stuff. Occasionally, for example, they have to travel to the Middle East, to the Persian Gulf countries to talk oil prices or to encourage investment in the United States or whatever. Um, these are all photos of those three Treasury secretaries visiting the Persian Gulf states. But there aren't all that many photos of them because there weren't all that many of those trips. Those three guys over the space of a decade, over two different administrations, all three of them together visited the Persian Gulf states eight times, eight times in total between all of them. Now, how about this guy? You recognize him? A little more recent guy who held the same job, Donald Trump's Treasury Secretary, Steven Mnuchin. During Trump's one term, during the four years he was Treasury Secretary, you know how many times he went to the Gulf states? At least 18. The last three guys went eight times in total between them. Mnuchin went 18 times just himself. That's a 12-hour transatlantic flight to visit his friends in the Gulf, probably more often than you visited your friends who live across town. I mean, his three predecessors, eight times combined over a decade. Mnuchin, 18 times in four years. Why is that? Well, new reporting from the New York Times suggests one answer to that question. Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin was visiting Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates and Qatar and Kuwait to scare up new investments for himself, not for the United States, which is a thing that's called self-dealing. And it's a thing that we're not supposed to do. Last month, the New York Times reported on truly remarkable sums of cash that the various Gulf monarchies had invested in private projects being run by Steven Mnuchin, as well as projects for Trump's son-in-law, White House advisor Jared Kushner. And the monarchies started paying out this fund, these funds almost as soon as those guys left the Trump administration. Last year, after Trump was out of office, the Saudis gave Steven Mnuchin a billion dollars for his new investment fund. They gave Jared Kushner two billion dollars. And they did this even though Saudi Arabia's own investment advisors explicitly recommended against it in writing because they determined that Kushner had no experience. He had no other investors. Their due diligence on Kushner's operations showed that they are, quote, unsatisfactory in all aspects. But still, the Saudis gave two billion dollars to Jared. Why is that? Well, his father-in-law's administration had bent over backwards for four years to try to protect Saudi interests, starting with making Saudi Arabia Trump's very first foreign trip as president, something no president had ever done and no other president ever will. Trump and, and Kushner and Steven Mnuchin defended the Saudis' autocratic de facto ruler after he rounded up and imprisoned hundreds of royal family members, after he started a blockade of the U.S. ally in Qatar, after he signed off on an operation to kidnap, kidnap and ultimately murder and dismember a Washington Post journalist. All that favor and protection over the course of four years has got to be worth something, right? A couple billion dollars at least, especially if Donald Trump might be president again one day. So there's this sort of implicit quid pro quo in that situation. Hey, remember how good you were when you were in office? Well, how about, uh, uh, remember how good our administration was to you when I was in office? Well, now how about you put some money in my pocket? How about you invest in my new project? That quid pro quo with, with Kushner in particular is icky enough, but this new reporting from the Times suggests that Kushner and Mnuchin may have actively been using their government positions to tee up these money-making enterprises for themselves once they left office. Right before the 2020 election, Kushner and Mnuchin unveiled a new U.S. government-backed investment fund that would ostensibly raise billions of dollars for projects in the Middle East. All through the end of the Trump presidency, Kushner and Mnuchin kept flying all over the Middle East on the taxpayer's dime, trying to raise money for this supposed government fund. Jared made three trips to the Middle East just in the weeks between the election and the inauguration of Joe Biden. And when the January 6th attack happened, he was on his way back from Saudi Arabia and Stephen Mnuchin was on his way to Saudi Arabia. Mnuchin ultimately cut his trip short because of the Capitol attack, but he did stretch it out still just a couple more days to try to squeeze in one more meeting with the leader of Saudi Arabia. Here's the thing, though. 
All those meetings were supposedly about this U.S. government-backed investment fund. The Times describes it as, quote, little more than talk. With no accounts, no employees, no income, and no projects, the fund vanished when Mr. Trump left office. Except Kushner and Mnuchin did later raise billions from all those countries they were scrambling to visit in their last months in government. They just didn't raise it for any U.S. government fund, which appears to have never really existed. They raised it for themselves. Just three weeks after leaving office, Mnuchin was talking about a plan he had. A few weeks later, he had detailed investment plans on a half billion dollars from the Emiratis, the Kuwaitis, and the, Qat and the Qataris. A half billion dollars from each of them. All these folks he had just been fundraising from as Treasury Secretary. Then came the billions from Saudi Arabia. Mnuchin and Kushner both took the government officials who had ostensibly been working with them on this government project and installed them at their new private ventures where they would get the money. In April of last year, when Mnuchin sent the Saudis a roster of the top executives at his new private venture for them to invest in, one of the managing directors was still, at that moment, employed by the U.S. Treasury Department. I mean, this isn't even like speeding up the revolving door between government and the private sector. This is like, there's no door. It means you go to work for the U.S. government, and in the name of the U.S. government, you raise money for yourself. On the one hand, it feels like, uh, you know, another bit of corrupt detritus from the Trump administration that is stuck to our collective national shoe. On the, other, on the other hand, this feels like something so blatant it cannot possibly stand. Can it? Joining us now is one of the reporters who broke this story, New York Times correspondent Kate Kelly. Ms. Kelly, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Rachel. Pre pleasure to join you. What is the connection between the meetings that Mr. Kushner and Mr. Mnuchin took as government officials and the later investment that was made by government officials in these foreign countries you've described um, to make these massive investments in private ventures for both of those men? Well, at a minimum, Rachel, I think those uh, business meetings built the relationships and kept them warm at a time when both Kushner and Mnuchin were a mere weeks away or just a couple of months away from leaving office as Trump stepped down. So they got to know their foreign counterparts. Uh, in Kushner's case, uh, these were rulers of countries, these were other senior officials, but also importantly, the heads of sovereign wealth funds or you know the large government investment funds uh, run by many countries and notably in the Persian Gulf. In Mnuchin's case, and you pointed this out in your intro, these 18 country visits over four years uh, which had a huge cluster toward the end of the administration, actually in January of 21, helped him get acquainted with these major, major investors who just mere months later would invest in his funds. Now, we also know that this Abraham fund you mentioned, this $3 billion, or at least that was the goal, U.S. government-backed fund that was meant to fund development projects in places like uh, Palestine, where uh, Israeli checkpoints would be improved and modernized, um, among other things. Uh, that was something that was on both of those officials' item agenda as they toured the Gulf in those final months of office to talk about building enthusiasm and support for the fund. But as you noted, it didn't really go anywhere. What did go somewhere right after government was Jared Kushner's private equity fund, Affinity Partners, and Steven Mnuchin's private equity fund, Liberty Strategic Capital. I described this as self-dealing, because as somebody who's not an expert in this, somebody just a lay observer, this seems like kind of the dictionary definition of somebody using their public position, their access to government uh, resources, um, potentially even their actions as government officials, to set themselves up for private gain. Um, is that fair in terms of the layman's understanding of that? And as an extension of that, is this potentially um, illegal behavior? Well, that was obviously one of the top questions we were asking ourselves, Rachel, as David Kirkpatrick and I reported on this. And what we discovered from talking to ethics experts is this is quite legal. Um, if, if we as Americans want to see this kind of activity ceased in the future, um, we need to probably codify some, some new rules and regulations that prevent one from seeking outside investments from former government counterparts once they leave office, in this case, the executive branch. But right now, this is quite legal. Self-dealing um, is a little bit more of a term of art, uh, but, but sure, I mean, depending on your perspective, 
I think that that is something you could say. Uh, there are laws that govern um, your participation as a government official in matters that substantially or personally affect your financial position or that of your immediate family. I'm sure you're familiar with those. I believe it's 18 USC 208. Uh, but in this case, while not impossible, while I did speak to some ethics experts and some lawyers who thought this could theoretically be applied here, it's, it's very hard because what you really need to establish is a quid pro quo. Um, so both parties, in this case, a sovereign wealth fund and these officials would have to know there was sort of a, a two-part transaction going on that resulted in them receiving this money. And I think, I don't know that that's the case. I wouldn't want to suggest that it was. Uh, but in any case, even if it were, very hard to demonstrate for a prosecutor. Right. Certainly to, to prove it in court. Um... Of course. Uh, Kate Kelly, New York Times correspondent um, with this groundbreaking reporting. Thank you for helping us understand it. I appreciate your time. Thank you. He is a Russian diplomat. Uh, he works for Russia at their UN mission in Geneva in Switzerland. He's worked for Russia's foreign ministry, their equivalent of our State Department, for two decades. Uh, he spent a large part of that time serving as an advisor on nuclear nonproliferation for the Russian government. Today he quit, and he didn't just quit quietly. He turned it up to 11. Um, this is how he told his colleagues. He said, quote, for 20 years of my diplomatic career, I have seen different terms of our foreign policy, but never have I been so ashamed of my country as on February 24th of this year, the day Russia invaded Ukraine. Quote, this aggressive war unleashed by Putin against Ukraine, and in fact against the entire Western world, is not only a crime against the Ukrainian people, but also perhaps the most serious crime against the people of Russia. Those who conceived this war want only one thing, to remain in power forever, to live in pompous, tasteless palaces, to sail on yachts comparable in tonnage and cost to the entire Russian Navy, enjoying unlimited power and complete impunity. To achieve that, they are willing to sacrifice as many lives as it takes. Thousands of Russians and Ukrainians have already died just for this. He goes on to say, quote, I studied to be a diplomat and have been a diplomat for 20 years. The foreign ministry has become my home and my family, but I simply cannot any longer share in this bloody, witless, and absolutely needless ignominy. The diplomat's name is, is, is Boris Bondarev. His statement also took a direct shot at his boss, uh, Russia's longtime foreign minister, which, again, is the, their equivalent of our secretary of state. He says of their foreign minister that he, quote, went from a professional and educated intellectual who many of my colleagues held in such high esteem to a person who constantly broadcasts conflicting statements and who threatens the world with nuclear weapons. And this resignation is fascinating. That final point is very provocative, right? This guy who has just quit the highest profile diplomatic resignation since Russia started this war, he's a nuclear nonproliferation expert. After he quit today, he told the New York Times he was disturbed by the nonchalance with which some of his fellow Russian diplomats chatted about possible nuclear strikes against the West. That is also a thing that is apparently increasingly happening on state-controlled Russian TV. Mr. Bondarev said of that talk, quote, they think that if you hit some village in America with a nuclear strike, then the Americans will immediately get scared and run to beg for mercy on their knees. Quote, that's how many of our people think. And I fear that this is the line that they are passing along to Moscow. Joining us now is Julia Davis. She's a columnist for The Daily Beast. She's the founder of the Russian Media Monitor, which tracks Russian government-controlled television and propaganda. Um, Ms. Davis, I really appreciate you making time to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. It's my pleasure. Uh, Mr. Bondarev today um, raised this issue in his resignation letter, letter and then in, in follow-up interviews, including with The New York Times, saying the nonchalance and the frequency of discussion about what a good idea it would be to use nuclear weapons, he, as a longtime diplomat, as an expert in the field, finds unnerving. I have to ask, in your monitoring of Russian state television, if you're seeing what he's describing. Absolutely. And it's so refreshing to hear someone who is an insider like him to address it because it's become um, redundant. Every single day they bring up the idea of uh, nuclear strikes against Ukraine or against the West. And it's a nonstop chatter that has been basically normalized at this point. If you could ever normalize anything as abnormal, they've become a uh, larger, more dangerous North Korea in their rhetoric. 
And this has changed, to be clear. This isn't a constant. This is something that's changed and become more frequent over the course of this war, over these last three months? Absolutely. They followed uh, Putin's lead when he said if anyone dares to interfere in what's going on in Ukraine, they will be met with such retaliatory um, action that they have never contemplated or have seen before. And on state television, they are repeatedly reiterating that what he meant was a nuclear strike. And they repeat that with a great sense of pride that that is one thing that they know the West fears. So they like to constantly repeat it and convince the Russians or attempt to convince them that even if they have to die for the motherland, there's no better way to go. From your monitoring of this type of propaganda, the state-controlled television in, in Russia, do you feel like that should make the West, that should make the American government, that should make us as people observing this um, more fearful about the prospect that Putin might choose to use nuclear weapons um, in either in, in some tactical way or in some strategic way. Do you feel like um, the, the saber rattling that you're seeing there should make us feel like this is a more acute threat? Or do you think this is just a sort of generic sign of belligerence and chest pounding that might not translate directly into a, a, a nuclear worry? We should remain clear-eyed about Russia's capabilities, but at the same time, keep in mind that they are saying it for us to be afraid for the West to stop helping mm. Ukraine. So it's definitely posturing, and we need to see it for what it is. It's the only thing that they could threaten us with. They can't threaten us economically. There's not much they can do to us, basically. So um, that is uh, one weapon at their disposal that they like to saber-rattle with, and uh, their motive is... Uh, to um, make us fear them. And uh, that's exactly what they're hoping to do. And that should be the opposite of what we do. The Russian government has yet to respond to this resignation from Mr. Bondarev today, at least as far as I know, they haven't responded yet. Um, what do you expect their, their reaction to it will be? Or do you think they'll just pretend this didn't happen? I can safely predict what they will probably do. They usually follow the same exact uh, script in this uh, types of instances. They will say he's a traitor. They will claim that he was offered some sort of a reward by the West and he uh, sold out. And this is the way that they will portray him, especially because his letter was so scathing because he referred to Navalny's investigations about Lavrov's uh, extended family uh, taking advantage of Oleg Deripaska's uh, luxury properties and Putin's palaces, all of those based on Navalny's investigation. So they will certainly try to claim that he is a quote-unquote uh, traitor simply for exposing their corruption and not being willing to, to put up with uh, their warmongering and uh, horrific acts of aggression that they have um, engaged in. Julia Davis is a columnist at The Daily Beast. She's creator of Russian Media Monitor. Ms. Davis, thanks for making time to be with us tonight. It's really helpful to have you here. Thank you so much. So Thursday last week was the day the January 6th investigation said, hey, Congressman Loudermilk, we'd like to talk to you because you led a tour on January 5th. In response, he released a new statement that, contrary to his earlier denials, he now admits he did lead a tour of the Capitol complex on January 5th. He admitted that in print on Thursday. Then on Friday, he released a video saying that he was only being persecuted for giving that tour that he previously denied. He was only being persecuted for it because the people on the tour were wearing red baseball hats. On January the 5th, I took a family with young children and their guests who were visiting Washington to lunch in a cafeteria in one of the house office buildings. So what was so awful about this family that caused the committee to make false accusations about them? Well, some were actually wearing red baseball caps. A family with young children and also their guests was the tour that you led on the 5th. And they were wearing red caps, you say. First, he said there were no tours given. And anybody who said there was a tour should be reported to the Ethics Committee and investigated. Then the further detail that if there was a tour, which there wasn't, definitely no one was on such a tour wearing a red MAGA baseball cap. Now it turns out, yeah, there was at least the tour led by him, the tour he led of all the people wearing the red caps. 
Congressman Barry Loudermilk got caught out by the, by the investigation on this on Thursday. He copped to it on that video on Friday. Then guess what happened on Saturday? Guess what happened next? You probably guessed this too. Statement from Donald J. Trump, quote, Barry Loudermilk has my complete and total endorsement. 